this morning, as we look at Titus 2, we are going through a passage that is uh, the ninth of 12 qualities. I mean, if you just want to know the technical thing, we're marching through the characteristics of godly older men, and we looked at six of those, and then godly older women, and we looked at five of those. And now we are on the fourth characteristic of godly younger women. And we're looking at what godly older women are supposed to make a commitment and a sacrifice to sit down and face-to-face talk over with every younger woman in the church. In fact, the lesson I'm sharing this morning, it should be a part of everything to do with young ladies in, in the church. It should be a part of their training in Sunday school, their training in their youth group, when they get into the college group, when they're in the young marriage group. This is what Paul said, they are to have older, wiser, godly, nurturing, mentoring in. But as we do that, look at the larger picture. Salvation is described in the Bible as being clothed with Christ's righteousness. In fact, the Bible says that that when we were born again, we were clothed. In fact, justification puts the righteousness of Christ on me, erases the record of my sin, pays the whole penalty. And when God looks at me, he does not see me the sinner. He sees me the righteousness of Christ. So salvation is all about me being clothed with Christ every day. My daily Christian life, Paul says in Romans 13, verses 13 and 14, every day we're supposed to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's almost like putting on a, a armor or putting on an overcoat, like when it's raining so you don't get soaked. Uh, we are to put him on. In fact, Colossians 3, it says we're supposed to clothe ourselves with Christ's virtues. So salvation is always portrayed as putting on Christ the armor of Christ, the righteousness of Christ, the, the characteristics of Christ. And so with that description, believers are clothed. We wear Christ. And with that in mind, Paul introduces a concept for women. He says, now, if you are clothed with Christ, and every day when you walk through life, you're wearing Jesus Christ, Does your spiritual message, clothed with Christ, wearing Christ, conflict with your physical message of what clothes you're actually wearing? So let me ask you a question. If Jesus Christ was here ministering in the 21st century, if Jesus actually, instead of Galilee, the first century was doing Western Michigan, 21st century, and he was doing his itinerant ministry around here, and walking around, and you saw him on Westnitch, or you saw him, you know, uh, in Portage somewhere, would, would the way you saw him at all differ from these descriptions? Because Jesus is walking around Portage, Kalamazoo, Schoolcraft, and everywhere in between in us. We're clothed with him. And when people see us, they're supposed to be drawn to him. Now, with that in mind, Would any of these descriptions portray Christ's appearance if he were ministering here? Do you think Christ would ever choose to dress in a way as he walked our streets that was provocative, that was sensual, and that was revealing areas of his body that God's word says need to be covered? I mean, that just sounds foreign to thinking of Christ. Do you think that Jesus would ever choose clothing that would make him appear skimpily attired? I mean, doesn't that, I mean, it's hard to say Jesus and skimpily. I mean, it doesn't go together. Can you imagine Jesus with a short skirt or short shorts or with some kind of a sexually arousing outfit? No, not at all, even if you try. Do you think Jesus could ever be described as hot? I mean, this cultural... I mean, uh, that's, that's supposed to be a compliment, by the way, in our 21st century, talking about sensual things. Do you think Jesus would be described as immodest, alluring? Do you think he would appear and try to be edgy? I mean, is that congruous with who the Bible reveals him at? When you think of being clothed with Christ... Does being clothed with Christ, walking through life as his representative, fit with also at the same time wearing clingy, form-fitted outfits, wearing sheer or nearly see-through materials, wearing plunging necklines or tops that are unbuttoned way too far? Does that fit? 
And you know what's so amazing in our culture? We have compartmentalized life. And, and it's kind of like work and school and social and sports and fun and media and God. And he doesn't ever spill into any of those cubicles. We, we have everything in the right spot. But Paul says, no, wait a minute. You are clothed with Christ. And Paul says, if none of those descriptions would ever describe Christ's choices in his clothing, then none of those words should ever describe you. That's what he's saying. He's saying, I want you to realize the God of the universe does care about what you wear. Because what you wear is supposed to be a reflection of wearing him. And Paul told Titus that for all the generation of Christ's church, godly and mature women, women of grace, were to come alongside every younger woman. It should be that no younger woman makes her way through the years and the grades and the levels of the church that she does not have either her mother as a godly, virtuous, mature woman or another woman in the church if her mother isn't a godly, mature role model. Come alongside of her and speak to her and beg her in Christ's name to be pure in her desires and modest in her dress. Do you remember when the devil wanted to attack Israel and destroy them? He knew he couldn't do it frontally. He couldn't come in with an army and have the Midianites or the Canaanites destroy Israel. So you know what he did? He incited Balaam to go get a whole bunch of the Moabite women to enticingly start luring the Israelites away from their holy and high calling. And, and they were defeated, Israel was, and thousands of them died because of the power of seduction. Titus 2 mentors are to show and remind every young woman that she is Christ's temple, that she is his living representative, a living model of what it means to be clothed in righteousness. And for 2,000 years, God has looked through every generation of Christ's church for those women who will devote themselves to his plan for their lives presented in Titus 2. And that plan is that they, first of all, embrace on the inside grace-energized purity. And then secondly, they not only have it on the inside, but they allow it to come out in their lifestyle. And the most obvious thing about your lifestyle is what you look like, and people see that. And then to come alongside of others and say, you know what? I, I don't dress this way because I'm legalistic. Do you know what legalism means? Two meanings of legalism. Galatians, biblical legalism is, I think that by keeping rules, I become righteous and go to heaven. Of course, we know the whole book of Galatians says that's wrong. A modern form of legalism is called externalism. And people think that if they conform to an external look, that means that they're godly. And that, that is externalism, that form of legalism. And, it, and it's just, oh, it's like paint. It doesn't matter, as Jesus said, that you're painting a sepulcher that's dirty on the inside, but you put white paint in the outside. That externalism or legalism is weak and powerless and does nothing for the church. When the church puts up rules and people conform to those rules only on the outside and there's no internal change, that externalism takes away the power of the cross. But when Jesus Christ is the operative center of our lives. Then like Paul, we say, I won't eat meat or drink wine the rest of my life if it causes anybody to stumble. And, and that was just in diet. Can you imagine how quickly a woman's dress can make a man stumble? And how widely that can occur? Well, the description of what Jesus wants in his church is that next character quality in Titus 2 in verse 5. And here God asks for grace-energized purity to be modeled, to be mentored, and to be sought after by every younger and older woman of Christ's church. And today, just as then, when women of grace offer themselves as willing servants to follow God's plan, he gives them the strength to go against the culture. Now, now we might think it's hard. Uh, I've, I've heard Bonnie lament when she goes shopping. She says, you know what? You have to go to so many stores to find modest clothing as, as we were raising our children. She says, it's just hard. And, for, for, and, and it's hard to go against, but just think what it was like in the first century. You think it's bad now? 
In the first century, athletic events were done completely nude. So if you like sports, you like nudity because they were synonymous. You went to the nude area called gymnasium. Gymnas in Greek means naked. So when you go to the gymnasium, you're going to see naked people wrestling, naked people sprinting, naked people boxing, naked people doing everything. That's why when they have the Olympics and they show that discus player and he has nothing on, they're not joking. That's how it was done. And that's the world of the first century. And Paul says, go against that. You have to resist the culture that's squeezing you into the mold. So, in Titus 2, starting in verse 3, God lists off 12 virtues that describe the life of a woman whose heart is indwelt by the Spirit and whose life is empowered by God's grace. And those 12 are what we're studying this morning. Let's stand together for the reading of God's Word. Hold your Bibles. I'm going to read starting in verse 3 all the way down to verse 5, and we're going to pray that the older women likewise, so that's group number two, that they be first quality, reverent in behavior, second quality, not slanders, third quality, not given to much wine, fourth quality, teachers of good things, fifth quality, that they go beyond just teaching and they personally face-to-face -face admonish the young women. It's not enough to have a class. You've got to go alone and talk to them. And starting in verse 4, that the young women love their husbands. That's their first lesson. Number two, love their children. Number three, are discreet. By the way, we saw that last time. It's the one quality that all four groups, universally, it's that sober mental health we talked about last time. Number four, chaste. That word right there is one of the biggest words in the New Testament over 300 times. Hagnas or hagiadzo. You might know it as holiness. You might know it as sanctification. Your Bible might say pure. Other versions say uh, chaste. But that word is one of the biggest concepts in the New Testament. And it says the application of that word needs face-to-face -face nurturing. Number six, homemakers. Number seven, obedient to their own husbands. Why would all these qualities be important? Look at the end of verse five. That the word of God may not be blasphemed. Let me say this. God says, this is what I want. And if you choose intentionally not to conform your life to this, the net effect is, for those who are not following God, your life becomes a walking blasphemy to the Bible because they say, mm, your God says this and you do that. You are not obeying your God. You are speaking against him. Blasphemeo. And so Paul charges the church with these qualities. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Dear Father, I thank you this morning that as we just read your word, we hear your voice across the centuries coming to us, the forever settled in heaven, refined as silver in the fire seven times, living and abiding word. And we say, Lord, speak to our hearts. Help us to choose today to respond to you. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You may be seated as you're seated. This morning, God declares in that second word, he wants all women in his church to be chaste, that's King James, New King James, or pure, that's English Standard, NIV, NAS. This word is, is as I said, hagnas, is, is an adjective, purity, or holiness, that, that is the adjective form of the verb hagiadzo, which means to sanctify, to make holy. It occurs all the way through the scriptures. Paul uses this word to describe our constant choices we're to make. Philippians 4.8. Uh, what sort of things are true, honest, just, pure, lovely, and of good report? There's that word hagnas. Uh, this is the same word John uses when he says believers, 1 John 3.3, 3, purify themselves as he is pure. Believers are constantly saying, I want my life to match up with my calling in Christ. And my calling is Christ. I'm clothed in his righteousness. I'm uh, his temple. And so I want to purify. I want to have my life hagnas. I want it to be reflective of God in his holiness. James describes the first manifestation of the Holy Spirit's wisdom within us as, in James 3.17, but the wisdom that is from above, from the Holy Spirit, from God, is first hagnas, pure, same word. 
Uh, Peter uses this word to describe our choices, to go against our godless culture. It says in, in 1 Peter 3, 2, they will observe your chaste, hagnas, pure, holy behavior. And they'll see, without a word, they'll see God through that. In fact, God's word says all believers are either being sanctified, hagnas, hagiadzo, or they're not genuinely saved. Um, it, it, it's amazing to, uh, to, to feel the impact of Hebrews 12. This is what the writer of Hebrews says. Pursue peace with all people and pursue holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. Only those who are clothed in Christ's righteousness, only those who are holy because of the work of Christ, his justifying work, will see God. But the other side of justification, it's kind of like a coin. If you get a coin or a dollar or 20 or a 50 or a hundred dollar bill and it's got, uh, you know, whoever's, let's see, who's on the five? Lincoln. If you have a Lincoln on this side and you turn it over and there's nothing on the other side, you better get rid of that quick. It's fake, you know? Uh, give it back to whoever gave it to you. If you find someone that says they're justified, that's one side, and you flip them over, and they are not in the process of sanctification, God says they're counterfeit. Because justification, the other side of that process, justification is what God does to us, sanctification is what that does in us. And that's what this is all about. As believers, we're reminded by God, he dwells in unapproachable light. And we're his dwelling place. And his only request is that we reflect that by the holiness of our life. Well, this call was hard. I, I told you about the athletics, but the sheer level of sexual temptation and immorality and immodesty that assaulted believers at every level in Paul's day rivals our day. And the net effect was the church was being influenced because when the church gathers, it's a close community. And if any individuals within the community are sending a mixed message, it lures and tempts those within the community to sin. That's why if you read the Bible and look for the listings of the sins, where Paul says, uh, you know, that, that those who are, da -da 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 -da, and he lists off a, a list of sins. Do you know what's either first or second in every list? There are 17 lists of sins in the New Testament that list off sin. Either number one or number two in every one of those lists is always porneia. Porneia means fornication, illicit sexuality, either written or portrayed or acted out. It's all lumped together. Porneia, fornication, uh, is pornography, pornographic activity. It's all one grouping of sin. And that's always first or second because of the sheer pressure of the culture around them. Well, look back at Titus 2 and verse 5, at being chaste or being pure. And you say, what exactly does that mean? Well, Paul, remember, Titus is one of three letters that are called pastoral. They're epistles to churches, to pastors, how to instruct the church. The other two epistles are much longer. Uh, they are ten chapters long. Titus is only three. The other two are written to Timothy. Timothy was a fellow you know, missionary pastor like Titus. Titus was on Crete. Timothy was left by Paul at Ephesus. Ephesus was the largest church in the ancient world. Upwards of 50,000 uh, that Eusebius tells us were attending that church at its height. So turn back with me to 1 Timothy, because Paul, by the way, all these qualities we're looking at in Titus, you can find in Timothy. They're just kind of scattered throughout the whole 10 chapters instead of all compacted into five little verses. And so if you look through the pastoral epistles, you find a completely parallel message uh, abbreviated and kind of distilled in Titus and elongated and explained in Timothy. And look at 1 Timothy 2.9 because I, I want to ask you a question as we look at this verse. Does God really care what women wear? I mean, honestly, just listening to this and looking at these verses, you have to answer that yes or no. Does God really care what women wear? And if yes, then you need to respond. If no, then you don't need to respond. So does God care what women wear? Well, look at 1 Timothy 2, 9. And by the way, don't take it out of context. Uh, he's talking about 
the church in the worship. Verse 8, I therefore the men pray everywhere without wrath and without doubting. He's talking about the gathered church when they meet, that, that, that what is supposed to go on and the holiness. And it continues in verse 9, in like manner, in this high calling for the conduct during worship, uh, also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel. Now, in case uh, that was unclear, he goes on to describe it with propriety, moderation, not with braided hair, gold, pearls, costly clothing, which is proper for women, which is proper for women professing godliness with good works. And what he says is he, tar he targets a social issue of the day. The modesty is clear. I mean, the, the provocative allurement of the Roman period is well attested. You can read Juvenal, any of the writers talking about how they lived back then. But what is this hair braided stuff? Well, the emperor's wife in the first century started doing something. She started having her clothes made with pearls sewn in. And so her clothing would have actual pearls and emeralds and rubies and diamonds sewn into the fabric. I mean, she wasn't just wearing them. She was wearing them. But that wasn't enough. They started having these elaborate, they'd grow their hair real long, and they would start wrapping around their heads. And they would weave in 24 karat gold, soft, and they would weave it into their hair. So their hair just was glistening with gold. And they would put in precious stones. So that when, you know, the people that were copying the top dogs, you know, the people that wanted to act like the emperor's wife, when the rich Christians would come in, they would start coming to church. And one of these women with the big, you know, with the gold and stuff, can you imagine how heavy that would be? How hard it would be to wash? Oh, man. But she'd come and sit down in the service. People couldn't even hear. They would all be watching her and thinking, oh, if one of those fell off, that's a month's pay. You know, or a year. I mean, they were just totally caught up with this. And it was disrupting the worship service, both the immodesty as well as the opulence. And so he says, I want you, verse 9, women, adorn yourselves in modesty. Now, does God really care what I wear? According to his word, very much. I was impressed recently. There's a website online called One Place. I don't know if you ever found it. It's, uh, uh, everybody is on there. I mean, if you ever listen to John Piper on the radio and you, you want to get what he says, it's, this broadcast is kept for a year on One Place. And John MacArthur and Billy Graham and everybody, Chuck Swindoll, everybody that's on there, they keep a year of their broadcast. So you can go to any one of them and even read the text. Well, it's a big site. And, and I noticed recently an article came across the front page. It was by Nancy uh, Le DeMoss, and she wrote an open letter to women and said, do you have any idea what your clothing is doing to men? And I, I just want to read to her opening two sentences. She said, this is a letter she found in a newspaper to the editor, a letter to the editor. And it says, the other day, this guy wrote a letter to the editor. The other day, I was going to the business office here at the university to take care of some financial matters, and I couldn't believe what had happened over the summer. The landscaping around campus was exceptionally great. There were new dorms. There were new faces. Unfortunately, what I saw most were the scantily clad females that were everywhere. Second paragraph. This is particularly hard for males because they are stimulated by sight. Now, guys, we're not off the hook because females dress inappropriately. We are called in 2 Timothy 2.22 to flee youthful lusts and pursue righteousness and faith and love and peace. However, this boy wrote in his letter to the editor, girls, help out your brothers. Consider your clothing and what the Bible says concerning the way you dress. Now, that would have never gotten published in the paper except it was a letter to the editor because it had moral, biblical content. But think about that. To walk through modern-day gatherings of young people, it would appear that no one even has the faintest idea that God invented clothing for a covering. I think the last thing clothing does these days is cover. It almost uncovers. And because of the fall, God clothed his creations in a modest way. And that's why Titus 2 is a call for older women to come alongside of younger women and say, God's grace should energize your appearance. Even if it's counter-cultural, even if it's going against the flow of everything in society as it was in the first century. 
Both Paul and Peter explained that a godly woman ought to be attracting attention to her godly character, not her physical body. Uh, look back at that, 1 Timothy 2.9. Let me just walk through the words. It says, in like manner also that women adorn. Do you see the word adorn? That word adorn is cosmeo. It entered into the English language as the word cosmetics. And to us, cosmetics only means makeup. But, but in the Greek language, cosmetics had the basic idea of arranging yourself, putting yourself in order, making yourself ready to be seen. So it says that the, the younger women, or that the women, get themselves ready to be seen. God is vitally concerned in how you're seen. Paul actually explained to Timothy that a godly woman should get ready for worship by wearing proper clothing. Uh, and basically what he says is that the worship service is just a gathering of all the saints who are living sacrifices of worship. And so when you come together from life, it should be that you are prepared and dressed and adorned and appear as a living sacrifice of worship. Now we're supposed to have a lifestyle of worship, see? But we have gotten into this compartment thing. We kind of have our church thing and we have everything else. He says, no, let it all flow together and, and make sure when you come to worship, you are properly clothed. The word behind proper, uh, adorn themselves with propriety. This proper is the adjective form of cosmeo. It means well-ordered. The Greek word clothing uh, goes far beyond clothing. It's just the entire appearance. So it's a well-ordered appearance. And we could apply this verse in many ways. Uh, Paul was telling Timothy he should teach the congregation how they were to come before God. And they should ask themselves questions like, do my clothes reflect the grace and beauty of womanhood? Or do they descend from that? Do they, do they make people think about other things? Do my clothes show my love and devotion to my husband? Do my clothes reveal a humble heart devoted to worshiping God? Do I really believe he owns my body, that I'm bought at a price, and that I'm wearing Christ? Do these clothes give a mixed message of wearing Christ? Or, or do people not even think of Christ? They just think of, of what they see. Or worse, do my clothes attempt to allure anyone in a sensual way? If we're focused on worshiping God, we would never have to worry about how we dress because our commitment to worship God would dictate our wardrobe, is what Paul's saying. He said, if your life is to be a sacrifice, now think in the Old Testament, that's why we have the Old Testament, it's like the picture book, God illustrates things. When Israelites were to bring sacrifices to God, they brought animals. God says, don't bring me a mangy cur. Don't bring me one that was half dead. It, you know, it was racked with disease and it's ready to die. I want your healthiest, your most spotless, your most perfect sacrifice. When we come before God, we're to be a living sacrifice. That means we give to God what most perfectly would reflect Him. And that's what this, this lifestyle that would be our commitment, that would dictate our wardrobe. Well, so the, the grace-energized appearance flows from a grace-energized attitude. Look back at verse 9. It says, the godly woman's attitude about the way she dresses in verse 9 is that she should dress modestly and discreetly. Uh, this, this propriety, moderation, moderately, uh, this, this idea speaks, it's a very interesting Greek word, the word translated modestly means a modesty mixed with humility. It, it connotes a sense of shame, not shame that she's a woman. Women aren't supposed to be ashamed of, of being a woman, but ashamed to ever dress in a way that would incite a man to lust or distract someone from worship. Either the immodesty cause him, incite him to lust, or the distraction from worship with all that opulence that, that people just can't even think about the service because they're looking at your tower of gems and, and glistening gold. A grace-energized woman will seek to avoid being a cause of temptation. This word connotes rejecting anything that displeases God. That's why Paul to the Thessalonians when he's talking about sexuality and purity, he says how that you ought to please 
God, he said, I taught you. He says, the goal of your deportment and, and going through life is not to please the world. Our goal is to please God in what we do. And so it, it is a sense of having a grief over a sense of sin. The essence of this word modesty is a grace-energized woman's attitude is she hates sin so much that she will avoid anything that would produce sin in someone else. Paul put it this way, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. And so whether therefore you eat or drink or get dressed, do it for the glory of God. And he says, I'll neither eat meat nor drink wine as long as the earth lives, lest I offend anyone. And so what he's saying is there's certain things that, that I can't do with my body because it will offend someone else because our clothing is to reflect Christ. It says in Romans 13, verse 13, let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust. He's talking about the old us before Christ. Verse 14, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, he talks about the Christian life like putting on Christ as clothing and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. So what he's saying is as you put on Christ as clothing and are putting the clothing on too, make sure that the clothing you put on makes no provision for the flesh to allure or to project a mixed message. It appears that many young ladies don't even understand that their clothing choices can impact men. One of the differences between the way men and women are wired mentally is men respond rapidly to what they see while women are more responsive to what they feel. And so because of that, one author wrote, what a man's touch is to a woman, the sight of a woman is to a man. As deeply as a man's touch can touch a woman, so deeply the sight of a woman can affect a man. And God designed men to be stimulated in this way by what they see. It's part of his wonderful design. But it only works when his rules are followed. And when a woman ignores the impact of her clothing choices and how that can impact a man, she is placing intentional stumbling blocks before that man. What we wear is almost always a personal choice. And what women wear can deeply and widely affect the men who see her. So for any redeemed woman bought at the price that Jesus paid, for her what she wears every day has eternal implications. Time after time we hear about married men who fall for the flirtatious, immodest, seductress at work. Is that man at fault for committing adultery with a sensual and moral woman? Absolutely, he is at fault. But so is she equally at fault for luring him onward by her attitude and her clothing choices. So Paul is saying, don't cause others to stumble. And I was thinking, you know, is this something that's new? I mean, it was in the first century. Is it just cropped up in the 21st century? Well, if you read the Puritans, I think, you know, sometimes it's amazing to read the Puritans. One Puritan author, uh, Richard Baxter, 350 years ago, let me read you a clip from his sermon. He said, way back then, that women ensnared men's eyes and desires. And this is how he put it. It's very classic. Godly women, though it be sin and vanity that is the cause, it is nevertheless your sin that is the unnecessary occasion. You may not lay a stumbling block in a man's way. You may not blow up the fire of their lust. You must walk among sinful persons as you would walk with a candle through straw and gunpowder or else you will see the flame you did not foresee when it is too late, quench. And I was reading that and I was thinking, how can those ladies that were wearing bonnets, black dresses from chin to toe, how can they be immodest? But somehow they must have had some immodest way of wearing their black Puritan outfits. And he said, listen, he says, you must walk through life as if you're carrying a candle among tinder dry straw and gunpowder. Amazing. When God's Spirit inspired Paul to call every woman of grace to modest purity, it was because for all the generations of Christ's church, they were to walk through life wearing clothing in such a careful fashion as if they were walking through tinder dry straw and gunpowder. Because women are temples of God. We're saved by his grace and we have a responsibility placed upon us 
to make our clothing reflect Christ. Um, if, if you've ever sung the song, There is a Redeemer, that beautiful song, it was written by a guy named Keith Green. He died in a plane crash uh, in the 80s, but his wife has continued his ministry. And recently on her website, it's called Last Day Ministries, uh, she wrote a letter challenging women about their clothing choices. And she said, do your clothes give a message opposite of what God desires you to project? And this is what she wrote her testimony. It's just two, sentence, or two paragraphs. She said, unfortunately, many Christians are lost in their own selfish little world and are either oblivious or uncaring about the effect their clothes have on others. They may even appear to have real excitement and love for the Lord. However, their body is sending out a completely different message. Melody Green says, I know because I've done it. Partly it was in ignorance, but mostly it was in rebellion. And this is what she says. I remember thinking, it's not my fault if those men can't keep their eyes off of me and on the Lord. They just aren't spiritual enough. Why should I have to change my dress because they're so weak? She concludes with this. But the Lord showed me it was my fault. I was responsible for causing my brothers to stumble, and I had to change. Once I saw the damage my selfishness was doing to others and to the Lord, I was ashamed of myself and embarrassed that I had ever represented Jesus in such an unbecoming way. Paul's words in Titus 2.5 are a challenge from God to every woman. The challenge is choose clothing that reflects the glory of God. Do you know what glory means? It means his weight. Kevoth ale, the weight of God. The weight of God should invade every cubicle, our media life, our social life, our work life, our academic life, and our clothing choices. It should invade it all, his weight. No woman of grace would ever want to become a lustful image in a man's mind. No godly woman would want to make a struggling man seeking to walk in the Spirit stumble and fall back into temptation. You know, the, the elders, when we meet twice, we met this month and had a, a wonderful gathering, they always say, what are you preaching on in the weeks ahead? And how can we pray for you? And I said, well, you know, the next word coming up pretty soon is going to be really interesting. They said, oh, how are you going to cover that? And I said, well, I said, you know, I'm going to talk to people about something they may not have thought about. Have you ever thought about the people that surround God's throne? When they leave God's throne and come and visit earth, remember the angels, the messengers from God? Have you ever thought about what they look like? What those who surround God, who always face him, what they look like? Specifically, they all wear clothes. Have you ever thought about how they're, they're portrayed in the Bible? In Mark 16:5. In one of those many descriptions of those who come from heaven representing God, the description of them is always the same. Mark 16, 5, and entering into the sepulcher, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a tight Speedo swimming suit. Oh, no, I was looking up from the Bible. That was being culturally relevant. Do you know what it says? Clothed in a long white garment. And as soon as they saw him glowing white, radiating the glory of the presence of God, they knew he was God's representative. When we see Jesus after the resurrection, glorified and speaking to us from heaven, when he's physically described, every time it's the same way. Every time he's described, here, here's one of the times. Revelation 1.13, In the midst of seven candles, I saw the Son of Man clothed with a garment down to the foot, girt about the waist with a golden sash. You know what he's dressed like? He's dressed like an Old Testament priest. Old Testament priests were, were men, were very cautiously modest. You want to read some interesting stuff? Read about how important God said even what parts of the men it says in Leviticus and Exodus, were not to be ever publicly seen. Fascinating. Finally, when we see the redeemed saints in heaven serving God, what do they wear? I mean, when we get to heaven and God passes out the clothes and we aren't going to Walmart to get them, what, what does he pick? 
One example, Revelation 7, 9, And behold, a great multitude, which no one could number of all the nations, kindreds, tribes, peoples, tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in the same outfit, these white robes. See, when God makes the people around him the way he exactly wants them, there is, there is a, even the cherubs, you know the cherubim? They have six wings, they have two, it says covering the top half, two wings covering the bottom half, and the other two, they're flying. They're, they're totally covered because of the greatness of the glory of God. To reflect God's glory by not conforming to the immodest world in which we all live is hard. But Paul told the early believers that it was agonizingly hard to struggle against the current of the world. And by the way, the current is only getting stronger. If you read the ending, in Revelation 9, 20 and 21, it says the whole world is in the grips of two things. Drugs and medicines. Pharmacon is the word. They're addicted to that. And secondly, they're addicted to what the Bible calls pornos. And that's immorality and immoral images. And do you know what the, the revolution of digital devices is? Do you know what the biggest market now for handheld devices is? And do you know what the companies can't wait until they can stream endlessly? It's, read the Wall Street Journal, the new market niche, if you want to make a lot of money in pocket computing, is called streaming pornography, available at the fingertips of everybody. That's why in Revelation 9, the whole world is completely saturated, the minds of humans, by the nonstop media that is, according to God's word, occultic and murderous and pornographic. By the way, the last time God saw everyone completely saturated with sin is Genesis 6, 5. And when he saw every imagination was only evil continually destroyed the world with water. And the next time he sees that the entire world is given over to pharmacon and pornos, he destroys it with fire. And that's where the world is headed. And in this time of growing spiritual darkness, Christ calls every believer to purity and every godly woman to intentional modesty. And Paul told Titus, for the generations of Christ's church, that godly and mature older women of grace should come alongside every younger woman and beg her in Christ's name to be pure and to choose intentional modesty for the glory of God. Let's all stand for a word of prayer. As you stand, I invite you back. Um, I never want you to miss something important. Uh, this evening we're having baptisms. Uh, we're having our West Virginia report. But the most important thing is, and I told the first service, when I get older and more uh, shaky and sickly uh, and, and have to choose, you know, when I'm in the rest home, when I can go to church, I'll always check the schedule to look for communion because the scriptures say that Jesus Christ actually comes and meets in a, in a way like not even in this service. Jesus comes at communion because we're celebrating him. And we're celebrating his death. Usually we just kind of celebrate him generally, but it's like we celebrate the most important event in the history of the universe, and that is the, the death of Christ as our atoning sacrifice. And because the focus is on him, the scriptures tell us he meets with us in a very special way. And so one of those gatherings, we only have two a month, one of them's tonight. It's a night when we come in front of Jesus and share a meal, communing with him. So I hope that you'll be a part. Let's bow before our Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for speaking to us. I pray that we wouldn't just have heard another lecture, but that as good Berean Christians, Acts 17, 3, we'll search the scriptures and see if this is so. And as we see it is so, that you want us to be hagnas, holy, pure, modest. I pray that there would be incremental choices to never, to never represent you by what we wear opposite of the message you want us to present. Oh Lord, make us those chaste representatives of you. In the name of Jesus we pray and all of God's people said, Amen, and God bless you as you go.